Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Howard Danes, a multi-award winning Hong Kong law firm who will be discussing disputes over assets between family members and the intricacies of this. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Willard Lee has 16 years of experience as a barrister and a solicitor advising clients on matrimonial law including divorce, nuptial agreements, jurisdictional issues, complex financial disputes, including maintenance and asset division, and issues regarding children, custody, care and control, access and relocation. Nathan Wong specializes in civil and commercial litigation with expertise in company and shareholder disputes, probate disputes, adverse possession, and finance related regulatory matters. As a solicitor advocate, he has been granted high rights of audience in civil proceedings before all courts in Hong Kong. He is also a chartered certified accountant. Jackie Tsai is currently an associate in the civil litigation department. Jackie has been closely involved in the handling of complex commercial litigation and is developing a speciality in this area of work. He also has experience in a wide range of other contentious matters, including contractual disputes, tort and negligence claims, fraud and asset recovery, regulatory investigations and employment disputes. Finally, Shirley Chan specializes in matrimonial law and advises on all aspects of the matrimonial law, including divorce, children issues, asset division, maintenance and settlements. Shirley has been recognized as a rising star in family law by the Doyle's Guide for both 2022 and 2023. Now, before I hand over to the, to the panel to begin today's webinar, a housekeeping item. You can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session, but please do reach out after for any additional information you may require. Now, my pleasure to hand you over to Willard, Nathan, Jackie and Shirley to begin. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for the kind introduction. So today we'll be talking about situations where family members get into financial disputes with one another. Now, this can arise in various ways, um, such as divorce, which is the most obvious example. So divorce has a great impact on a couple's finances, and sometimes money is the thing that actually leads to a divorce. Inheritance. When a family member passes away, um, some families may have issues with a will or how a relative's estate is being administered. And finally, family businesses. This is where the shareholders are also family and they can have disagreements on the operation of a business. So since Shirley and I specialize in matrimonial law, um, we'll be speaking about issues arising from divorce. Nathan and Jackie, who specialize in civil litigation, will be speaking about inheritance and the family business aspect of disputes. Um, slide three, please. Quite often, we see divorcing couples get into heated fights over money. So who gets the property? Who's going to pay for the children's tuition? Do I have to share my retirement benefit? Things may get even more complicated when a third party, such as one of the couple's parents or a sibling, may have an interest in one of the family's assets. Now, of course, in an ideal world, a couple would be able to sit down at the kitchen table and sensibly resolve the family finances between the two of them. Well, unfortunately, there are many cases where the couple would need lawyers to assist them or for the court to actually step in and make a decision. Uh, next slide, please. Looking first at the question of assets, the, the first step in the financial process is to identify what, what are the family assets. To do this, each spouse must complete a sworn document called a Form E, financial statement, in which they disclose all of the assets that they own, uh, along with some other financial information. When we talk about ownership, this includes legal ownership and beneficial ownership. So Shirley will expand on these two concepts later on in the webinar. The types of assets to be disclosed will include things such as bank accounts, uh, landed properties, including information about the value of the property, the funding details, and whether there are any mortgages outstanding on the properties. 
the parties would also have to disclose shareholding in private companies or interests in private businesses. They would have to declare stocks or securities, bonds, things like that in their ownership, as well as possible stock options uh, from their employers. They would also have to disclose life insurance policies and other types of investments. Um, other assets may include trusts where they are a beneficiary, such as a family trust from which they may receive distributions. They would also have to de declare retirement benefits such as MPF in Hong Kong or pensions in other places. Lastly, we have valuable personal items. Now, this can be anything which has a resale value and can be anything from cars to jewelry to art or boats, let's say. Along with the assets, the parties also have to disclose what their liabilities are. So liabilities is a more simple concept. There would be loans, credit card debts, or other debts that you may owe to people or other financial institutions. Um, in addition to assets and liabilities, the parties also have to declare information about their income and expenses. This would be rele uh, relevant to the question of maintenance, which we'll discuss, discuss later on. As you can see, the, the information to be disclosed is very comprehensive. Lots of people will have difficulty with this because it really makes you try to get your financial house in order. I think, to be honest, if I had to fill in the form E, I would have a great difficulty myself. So the overall objective of the financial disclosure process is to enable a couple and the court to have a clear financial picture of the family finances. Uh, when we look at the net amount of the couple's assets, which are all of the assets minus the liabilities of both parties, this will form the family pot, and this is what the court will have to work with. Next slide, please. Once we figure out the size and composition of the family pot, the court can then decide on how assets will be divided. The overall guiding principle that the court will employ would be fairness. Um, what this means is that the assets are seen as the fruits of the marital partnership. The idea is that both parties contribute equally to a marriage, but each in their own different way. One spouse may be making financial contributions, while the other may be making contributions towards raising the family. Um, and in, in situations where there are limited financial resources, the court will try to divide the assets to make sure that the couple's housing and financial needs can be met so far as possible. This may result in an unequal division of assets where instead of 50-50 division, you may have a situation where one party gets 60%, the other party gets 40%. And on top of that, there may be a situation where um, the financially stronger party would be paying maintenance to the other party for their living expenses. If, if there should be assets which go beyond satisfying the couple's immediate needs, the court will try to employ an equal division of assets. So in summary, the court has a fairly wide discretion when it comes to the division of assets, and the courts will be try, sorry, will try to be flexible uh, in their objective to achieve fairness. The next slide, please. Right. So as I previously mentioned, there is also the concept of maintenance. What maintenance is, is a sum of money paid by one spouse to the other to help pay for their financial needs and living expenses. Um, for non-lawyers, you may know this as the American term, alimony from TV and movies you, you may have seen. A very common scenario here would be where stereotypically, the husband is the breadwinner of the family with greater financial resources and a greater earning capacity. The wife may be a housewife or a stay-at-home mother who has less assets in her name or may have a lower earning capacity because of time that she spent away from the workforce. So in cases like this, the wife may need financial assistance after the divorce, especially in the cases where the children may be living with the mother. In such cases, the court would assess what is the reasonable need of the spouse 
and the children in terms of their monthly expenses. And the court would do this by reference to the living standard of the of the family during the marriage. Now, of course, the, the court understands that one income cannot support two households at the same level. And the court will try to do its best to, to try to adhere to the living standard, but it would be impossible to replicate two families living under the exact same conditions. On the other side of the coin, the court would also look at what the paying party is able to afford. The court would need to look at what the income of that party is and, and what their own needs are as well. So how long will maintenance last? Um, in terms of spousal maintenance, it, it really depends on the situation. Where the couple is, let's say, relatively young and the receiving party has an earning capacity and simply needs a few years to get on their feet financially, then the maintenance could be paid for a fixed term of several years, let's say. Or on the other side of the spectrum, it could be a situation where there is a long marriage, say 20, 30 years or more, uh, where the dependent party has very little earning capacity and um, there really is no prospect that they can get into the workplace and, and build a career. So in that case, they may need maintenance for life. As to children, um, there may be an obligation to pay maintenance um, until the child reaches the age of 18 years of age and can be expended, uh, extended in situations where the child is ongoing um, further education after they turn 18, such as the first university degree. Now, um, I've tried to simplify things quite a bit to give a very general overview. Um, if, if financial matters in a divorce get disputed, things can become very, very complex because there are a lot of factors involved as I've just tried to briefly highlight. So having said that, this is a good time for Shirley to go into greater detail about special situations such as the treatment of the matrimonial home or what happens when there are third party interests and assets owned by either spouse. Thank you, Alert. Um, I will first talk about how matrimonial home is being dealt with in a divorce proceedings. First of all, what is a matrimonial home? In the simplest term, it means the home where the family lived. Um, it is actually well established um, in the family law that a matrimonial home has a central place in any marriage, um, regardless of the marriage being a long one or a short one, or the marriage uh, or the property is a sole name or a joint name properties. Each party is entitled to equal division of the matrimonial home. Um, I believe that's easy to understand and relatively straightforward in relation to uh, matrimonial home. However, as, um, as Willard said, when things come to third party, it can get complicated. Erin, uh, can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so today's topic is about family members. So I will uh, talk about two scenarios where uh, the third party concerned is um, the parent. It can actually be siblings or friends, but um, for today's purpose um, and to avoid confusion, I will use the example of parents. So the first scenario is when one party um, tries to claim that the property is in my name, but it actually belongs to my parents, and my parents paid for the purchase price. In these kinds of scenarios, um, the party are trying to um, argue the property out of the matrimonial pot and try to say that my husband or my wife should not get a share in the property. The second scenario is when one party tries to argue that although the property is in the parents' names, it belongs to my husband or my wife, therefore the property should be put back into the pot and therefore I should get a share in it. In these um, two scenarios, you can see in law, there are two kinds of interests, legal and beneficial interest. For legal interest, in the simplest term, it means um, in whose name the property is registered in. For beneficial interest, it means who the property really belongs to. 
For example, in the first scenario, the property is in the child's name. Therefore, the legal interest falls on the child. Um, and if it really, um, if it's so proven that it actually belongs to the parents, then the beneficial interest will fall on the parents. In matrimony, uh, in third party interest cases, um, we, we, what we want to work out is the beneficial interest. Um, in, in these scenarios, um, the question will therefore be uh, where the beneficial interest is, whether it's on the parents or on the child. Next slide, please. So how the court decide um, where uh, or who owns the beneficial interest of the property? The test is actually um, what is the intention of the parties. In these kind of proceedings, um, the third party or the parents in this case will be joined as the uh, intervener in the in the divorce proceedings, and the court will look at um, evidence such as the source of purchase funds, uh, which means who pay for the property. Um, is there a mortgage? Uh, who pay for the mortgage repayments? Who has control over the property? For example, um, renovation, maintenance, um, repair, who pay for all of these? Um, for example, management fees, who pay for them? Um, is the property rented out? Who decide um, who to rent it to, how much the rent will be, and also who received the rent. And sometimes, um, and quite important um, evidence will be any contemporaneous record of the conversation between the family members. Um, what kind of arrangements are there? At this point, I can give um, an example where we have come across um, it involves a landed property owned by the daughter. Um, the mother paid for the down payment. She paid for the uh, mortgage repayment. So basically she paid for everything, but the property is registered in the daughter's name. Um, unfortunately, the daughter had to get a divorce. And so um, the husband tried to claim that um, the property is actually beneficially owned by the daughter and uh, it was actually a gift from the mother and it was a matrimonial home and he should get half of it. Um, but in that case, um, the mother had been uh, unusually prudent. She kept all the payment receipts. Um, she had a written agreement with the daughter saying, I let you live in my property but um, as long as you pay for all the household expenses, the utilities or the management fees. But that is quite an unusual, um, unusual example because uh, of the nature of family arrangements is usually it's based on trust. So usually there are some common characteristics, which is um, it is usually oral, it's, there's no written record um, or the, the, the whole arrangement is not fully spelled out because they, they didn't anticipate a separation or divorce um, or any disputes. And it could be quite creative sometimes because it does not have to make commercial sense. But after all, it's, it's a matter of the evidence showing the intention of the parties in particular when um, the property is being acquired. So bearing that in mind, um, uh, my sharing and Willett's sharing of today for now will end and I'll pass on to our partner, Nathan. Thank you, Shirley, for the sharing. Uh, indeed, uh, as you have just mentioned, third party, uh, namely the parents or the in-laws will actually come into play when there are family disputes. So I'm going to focus uh, on the disputes over inheritance which is a topic usually used in drama, TV, and movies. Um, but in reality, um, inheritance uh, is a major topic that the family members may fight over against each other, uh, leading to lengthy legal battles and broken relationships. Uh, the, 
fight over inheritance can be very contentious, uh, sometimes more contentious uh, than normal commercial disputes. Um, family members normally have uh, different views on the, um, on the intentions of the deceased. So they may say, oh, I don't believe uh, the will would be like that, or I believe the father should have provided me more, I deserve more. So there are common arguments. Um, one thing, some people may think, I don't have much money. I don't need to worry about it. It will never happen to my children. Um, sad to say, in reality, uh, inheritance disputes happen regardless of, um, of the size of your estate. And also sadly, sometimes when the parents are still, are still alive, the children may get along, but when the parents um, pass away, then the relationships may change. Um, that's why from, from day to day, we, we have handled a lot of uh, disputes over inher inheritance uh, between siblings, children, or sometimes between the in-laws and, and, and the children. So my sharing will be divided into three parts. One is uh, making uh, of a will. Second, challenging a will. And the third would be removing a executor. So let's start with the first part. Uh, next slide, please. Making a will. First of all, I want to explain some terminologies that we may have heard of, but don't actually understand its uh, precise meaning. Test data would be the one who is making the will, which is uh, easy to understand. Uh, beneficiary uh, would be the one who benefits from the will. So normally the person who will receive something from the disease. And the third term, executor, would be the most uh, tricky one. Um, but this is a very important concept. The idea is this, when a person passed away, uh, the estate would not automatically be distributed among the uh, beneficiaries by the banks, by the government. There's no such thing. Someone has to do it. Someone has to go through a process. So the process would involve collecting the assets, identifying the assets and liabilities of the deceased, engaging lawyer to make an application to the court, a very uh, specialized court called um, the probate registry, and um, to uh, get the documents and to do the distributions. So someone has to do it. It can be uh, the uh, beneficiary, but uh, it can also be someone else. So in making a will, the testator can name that executor. Um, the executor has to be uh, over the age of uh, 21. Uh, if we are worried about there may be quarrels uh, between family members, then one can appoint a professional executor, normally a lawyer or a, um, an accountant. Um, there is no legal requirement to engage a lawyer to prepare a will. There's no such thing, but it is highly advisable, uh, not only the preparation of the will itself, but also generally how we should prepare um, uh, 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 the distribution of the estate and also many factors that we may want to take into account. I'm going to share two specific uh, cases um, about the fight over inheritance. Next uh, slide, please. This case uh, is uh, quite uh, typical. It's about challenging wills. Um, the father was a self-made uh, billionaire. He married a wife. They had a son together, but sadly, the wife passed away. Then the husband married a second wife and had a daughter with the second wife. So a son with the first wife and a daughter with the second wife. Two families, two households. The billionaire made the will when he was at his 80s. Sadly, no medical doctor was arranged to certify his mental capacity at the time. And in the will, this husband gave 
all his assets to the son and left nothing to the daughter. So it seems horrible. Um, after the father uh, passed, there's a dispute between the son and the daughter. From the daughter's perspective, she's saying, no, 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 that is impossible. The will must be fake or must be made under the pressure of the son. Um, in any event, the will should be void or invalidated. This is because if the daughter succeeded in challenging the will, then the distribution mechanism will follow the law of intestacy. So according to the law of intestacy, the children can share the estate, generally speaking, in equal shares. So it would be more beneficial to the daughter if there's no will at all. So from the daughter's perspective, I challenge the will. But of course, the son would say, would, up, would want to uphold the will. And in this particular case, we acted for the son. So obviously, the daughter went to the court and say, okay, the father did not have the required mental capacity when he made the will. We acted for the son. We explained to the court why the distribution was this unusual, so to speak. We submitted to the court. We say, yes, this may seem unusual. All of the estates uh, go to the son, but please understand this. The father was a traditional Chinese man. And according to the traditional values, rightly or wrongly, he wants, he wanted the estate to be passed down to the male descendants. And, and, and for the daughter, he did provide for the daughter during his lifetime. So something has been done, some assets have already been left to the daughter, only not in the will. But during the lifetime, something has been provided to the daughter. This legal battle lasted for five years. It created a lot of pressure and, um, on the family. Ultimately, we won this case. The court upheld the will. So the lesson of this case um, is twofold. One, when the person making a will is at an old age, we should get a psychiatrist to certify the testamentary, testamentary capacity of the person. And secondly, when the distribution is quite unusual, meaning that, oh, I give more to one but not to the other, or I try to exclude somebody, something like that, um, it is better to explain it somewhere, like in a will. In a will, it allows the testator to actually explain the rationale or what he's thinking in mind. Um, according to the general rule on uh, freedom, uh, testamentary freedom, uh, the testator uh, actually can, uh, is at liberty to distribute the assets in any way that he wants. Next slide, please. The second case that I want to share uh, is um, the previous one, the, the, the second slide. Can we move to the previous slide? Yes, this one. Um, so this is about the, uh, okay, uh, challenging the wills. The last point that I want to say is that um, we will require uh, expert evidence in this kind of uh, cases. Psychiatrist and also a neurologist uh, would be required. Okay, the next case is about removing uh, executor. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it involves children from uh, multiple uh, marriages. Um, there are two camps. Um, in the uh, removing uh, executor uh, scenario, uh, I want to uh, share one particular case. <clears throat> because when there is no will, um, 
the it will follow the law of uh, intestacy. So we can move to the next slide. And according to the law of uh, intestacy, the law would favor descendants. So when the deceased left uh, a spouse and the children, the spouse and the children will share all of the estate. If the deceased left children and no spouse, the spouse may predecease him, all the estate would go to the children. But there is one special scenario, which are quite common nowadays. The deceased left no children, but um, the spouse survives him. And there are parents. So in this scenario, the parents actually able to get a share of the estate. But we know sometimes the in-laws do not get along with the children. So in a case that uh, I've handled, the spouse refused to distribute estates to the father-in-law. The, 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 the daughter-in-law is like, I'm his wife. I should get everything. So even though there's no will, it should follow the law of intestacies, in the daughter just refused to do any distribution. So it necessitated a court action and we acted for the, uh, the father, the father-in-law, and we succeeded in compelling the daughter to do the distribution. So these are the two cases that I would like to share. The next topic would be about what happens when family members run or um, uh, own the same company, the same family uh, business. And I will pass it on to Jackie. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so yes, I will talk about situations and another possibility um, of how disputes can break out between family members is where they run or jointly own the same company. This is actually something more common than we thought. Okay, so, uh, we can get on to the next slide. So um, obviously there are quite a lot of possible scenarios where um, family members can you know, get involved in, in the same company. But I would just, um, by way of illustration, I'll just talk about one possible scenario which we have dealt with quite often. Um, so when we look at this sort of simple diagram, we, we've got a first generation parents here, um, a father and a mother, who typically make uh, quite a lot of money, uh, quite successful in the business throughout their life, accumulated, accumulated quite a lot of wealth. Then in the advanced years, they are thinking about passing on the legacy, the business um, to the next generation. So, for example, if they have three children, then they're thinking about how to how to um, um, pass on those kind of assets to them. So, one possible way is by forming a family, so so-called family company, in which um, three siblings, for example, would be the shareholders. Um, but most of the time, the shareholding would be different um, for various reasons. Like for this, in this example, we've got sibling A, who is a 60% majority shareholder. For example, sibling uh, C may be just a 10% minority shareholder. Um, so I will talk about some, some of the weak causes that a minority shareholder in the position of sibling C could have when, for example, uh, sibling A and B uh, uh, having some kind of misconduct and running the company in a way that sibling C doesn't want to. Um, so before I get on to the next one, then actually we have come across an even more complicated um, um, example where on the first layer, the first generation layer, there's actually more than one family. Um, for example, if uh, a father uh, for some reason has more than one spouse or one partner, so to speak, then there are you know more than one family on the first layer. We've even seen cases where um, these you know, children from different families with different households, they are involved in the same family company. They are shareholders of the same family company. And as one might expect, this um, when the first generation pass away, then disputes can, can arise because, you know, children between different families may not exactly look eye to eye to each other. And that's where quite a lot of shareholder disputes can arise. So next slide, please. 
So when if I'm sibling C, I'm a minority shareholder and I feel aggrieved by you know certain actions that the other side of the other so-called majority shareholder camp has conducted, then what recourse do, do I have? Um, um, being in mind that obviously today is not a, a law lecture, so I would be very uh, uh, I will not be very long-winded because for these these three options, uh, um, each one can be a one-hour long lecture. So um, just briefly going through um, what uh, can a minority shareholder do. Um, derivative action is quite a fancy name, but um, it's, it means that um, a minority shareholder can bring proceedings on behalf of a company in circumstances where um, the majority shareholders or the directors who are in control of the company basically refuse to take any actions, even if this company is suffering losses. Um, in a typical scenario, me as a minority shareholder, I don't have influence, I don't have power um, over how the business of the company is conducted, then what options do I have? And if by going through this option, you can apply to the court and say, oh, these are something that I should have done uh, on behalf of the company, and I'm doing these things on behalf of the company to recover the losses that the company has suffered. Um, second remedy is called the unfair prejudice remedy. Um, in very general terms, the court can order a wide range of remedies to cater for situations where a minority shareholder is harmed uh, by unfairly prejudicial conduct. Um, I would just focus on one uh, remedy that's commonly used, uh, that would be the buyout, sort of the buyout order, meaning that um, the majority shareholder is all about court to buy out the minority shareholder. Um, why is this important? Because um, when a minority shareholder get into a dispute, like, you know, between family members, more often than not, they are not looking to continue with the relationship to run the same company. They are looking to exit the investment with a fair return. So that would be a very attractive, you know, uh, uh, relief for them because they can get uh, the investment back and then they can end the relationship with the shareholders, uh, which they have fought over over the years. And one last uh, uh, option that I will mention is just as an equitable winding up. I would just say this is a very draconian remedy because uh, um, winding up means basically means bringing a company to an end. So when we go for this remedy, we are saying that there's a huge breakdown of trust and confidence between you know people running a company. It basically make, makes no sense at all for you to continue the business. Um, the company is not making any profits, going nowhere then the best way is for you to wind up the company and put it into uh, to an end. But obviously that would be a very just take and, and a last resort remedy that uh, we use. So next slide, please. Um, so at the risk of overgeneralization, I would just very briefly also mention what are the reasons or what are the common fact patterns that we have to support the um, different kinds of applications that I just mentioned. Um, these are all very common allegations that we see in when when we, for example, when a client asks for the court of grant remedy based on the unfair prejudice, for example, uh, uh, petition. Um, one typical example would be excessive remuneration. For example, if I am the majority shareholder who also happens to be the director of the company, then sometimes I'm more incentivized to sort of give myself a more lucrative remuneration package. This, in this regard of the minority shareholders' interest. So that's one fact that is commonly uh, used against in, in these sort of uh, applications. Um, second one, setting up competing business and making secret profits, they're more or less the same thing, meaning that outside of my company, uh, the family company, I also set up my own sort of individual uh, companies that I'm interested in. You know, often I, I, don't, I don't tell the others about you know, the existence of this company, and then I defer business opportunities belonging to the family company to my own company. Um, and the last one I would say is sometimes in some exceptional circumstances, the fact that no payment of dividends uh, made uh, over a long period of time to shareholders can also be used as a ground to support the applications that I mentioned. But obviously that would be uh, need to be something very egregious. For example, when the company makes a huge profit over 20 years and it's still, there's still no dividends, then that might be uh, one factor. Last thing I want to mention is that usually in these sort of applications, uh, we as legal advisors put in, or usually put in quite a lot of different factors to support um, our application because, as one might expect, um, 
the, the majority shareholder who is in control of the company is not likely to only engage in one form of misconduct. It's also uh, often, oftentimes a host of misconduct um, in managing the company, which we can use to support a good application. Um, so I'll then pass the time back to Willard uh, um, to talk about some scenarios where our two departments may have worked together in some cases. Thank you, Jackie. So this brings us to the section of crossover topics. Now, these are cases which may begin in one practice area, such as a matrimonial law case, but spill over onto another practice area, such as civil litigation. So in such circumstances, our departments or our teams will need to cooperate and work together to help solve our clients' problems. Now, one such case is one where uh, Shirley and I worked on, where we represented the husband in a divorce proceeding. Uh, one of the main assets of the family was a private company. Now, at the same time, it was an operating company which ran a, a business. And at the same time, it was also holding a lot of the family assets um, as an asset holding vehicle. Now, to put pressure on our client, what the wife did was she made an application to the company's court to wind up this private business. Normally, such an asset would be dealt with in the family court, which is perfectly equipped to deal with assets such as companies. But the wife had done this in this case as a tactical move to, to place additional pressure on our client. So, of course, I had to resort to seeking the help from Nathan. So, Nathan, can you share with us um, how you handled that case? Sure, uh, Will. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I still remember the case uh, when Willard uh, reached out to me saying that, okay, there's, a, there's suddenly a winding of proceedings in the middle of a divorce proceedings. So, um, any ideas? Um, it is actually quite common uh, in the context of a company. Um, in this particular case, the wife and the husband uh, co-owns the company 50-50 and they are both uh, directors. Uh, this is the legal structure. But in reality, as we all can understand, one party may have more of a control over the company than the other. And in this particular case, it's the husband. Husband is the main person who's actually giving orders to the colleagues, seeing clients, ordering, making orders from the suppliers, so act in actual control. So when things are good, then that's fine. The husband and the wife work together. But when their relationship uh, went bad, then the husband, in this particular case, try to exclude the wife's participation in the business totally. Like locking the door, changing the lock, changing the passcode, um, uh, uh, of the SS card, something like that, uh, asking the colleagues not to obey, not to listen to the wife, despite the wife uh, remains as a director at the time. So um, this is what happens. Uh, the wife, uh, as Willis just uh, introduced, uh, uh, filed a winding up petition. And the wife, as a main contention is this, um, I have no control over the company. I want to take a look at the books and records. So I need to do this uh, winding up uh, process. So we acted for the husband, we argued. I argued before the court saying, hey, 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 this is procedurally wrong. Normally speaking, when there's a dispute between a couple, a wife and a husband, all relevant facts should be put before the same court preferably the same judge. So the judge can have the big picture and make a decision as to how the assets should be distributed. So we say that this is a parallel uh, litigation. This is wrong, procedurally wrong, it's unfair. Uh, there are similar uh, facts. It should be dealt in one court rather than two courts. It's a waste of money. And fortunately, um, we succeeded in the argument and the uh, wife eventually uh, withdrew the uh, winding of proceedings. So uh, 
we would say that um, this is beneficial not only to the husband but also to the couple as well because at the end of the day they are sharing the matrimonial pots so too much money uh, being spent on the uh, legal fees may not be good for them right thanks nathan so um shirley will bring up another area uh, yes, Jackie and I worked on another case where we represented the wife in the divorce proceedings. In that case, the parties lived in a property held by a holding company owned by the husband's parents. And upon um, recommencing the divorce proceedings, uh, the husband's parents tried to kick her out from the property. And then they tried to issue a high court proceedings um, trying to um, get vacant possession and also trying to claim monetary compensation um, for our client refusing to leave um, the property. Yeah, so um, actually when Shirley handed the case over to me, um, when I had a chance to look at the case papers and the evidence, I, I immediately felt like um, our client, the wife, is facing sort of an uphill battle in, in this high court action. Um, the reason is that the, the interesting feature that, or this feature that stood out to me, is um, the holding structure of the, of the matrimonial home of the property in question. Um, so that property was owned by not only a third party, but a company, which on paper, the husband has no involvement. Like he is not a shareholder, he's not a director. Although we know, um, you know, deep down that the company is somewhere, in some way related to, uh, to the husband's family. But um, it's, it, uh, the holding structure is, is planned, is well planned ahead, and that's why it's difficult to, to, for us to assert that that property should be um, one of the assets in the matrimonial pot. Um, one other interesting feature that we call in that case is that the company, the holding company which um, held the property, actually even went further to enter into a tenancy agreement with the husband. So there were evidence showing that uh, the property was, was rented to the husband, and um, there were payment records showing that the husband actually paid monthly rent to the, pro uh, to the company uh, in return. So that makes it even harder for, for the wife to sort of argue that um, the, the husband is expected that the husband would have any beneficial interest in that property because if in that case you would not have to uh, enter into a tenancy agreement at all, you can just live in the property that you yourself own. Um, so this is actually quite um, um, I, as I said, it's quite an uphill battle, but it's quite different from um, the, the usual or other scenarios that we've, that, like the two, our two departments have dealt with. For example, in another case that we call, when um, there's an ongoing dis divorce proceedings between husband and wife, and perhaps the matrimonial home is owned by the wife, then the husband actually took out a separate high court action to, to claim for beneficial interest in that property. So in that scenario, we say that there's good reason for um, the whole dispute, all the disputes to be dealt to, uh, with together in the family court. And the fact that the husband, you know, commenced a separate high court action uh, in an court to claim for the same property would be an abusive process. And also a, uh, that, that would be a satellite litigation, you know, with a view to put pressure on the wife. Um, so uh, speaking of the, the, uh, the outcome of the case that Shelly just mentioned, uh, actually, the wife, our client, um, actually uh, agreed to vacate the property in the end as part of a larger settlement. So the other side uh, is willing to forego the monetary compensation part. And in the end, because of the fact that uh, uh, the client has recognized the main battlefield in her action would be in the family court, would be uh, in the matrimonial proceedings. So by virtue of the fact that she uh, no longer had a, a, a place to live, because she has moved out, then she is able to claim maintenance uh, for living expenses, for rental expenses from the husband in the matrimonial case. So it's not entirely a very, uh, a, a, a very bad outcome for her, I would say. Okay, thanks, Jackie. So that brings us to the Q&A session of the proceedings. So thank you, participants. We have a lot of interesting questions today. Um, I'm going to have the first question to Shirley. The question is, what if my spouse fails to disclose all of his assets in the Form E? What, what can I do? Um, first of all, after Form E, there's a procedure um, called questionnaire and answer. Questionnaire is actually a document 
for parties to ask about each other's Form E. Uh, for example, if you know that um, there's a certain asset which is not disclosed in the Form E, you can ask about it in the questionnaire and the other party will have to answer it in the answer. But if there is still unsatisfactory disclosure, then uh, one can actually seek leave for further questionnaire or can make application for a specific discovery. Um, in general, parties owe a duty of full and frank disclosure to the court. Failure to comply with the same um, will result in adverse inference with cost consequence. Thanks, Shirley. I think uh, Nathan's going to pick a question for Jackie. Yeah, um, I'm looking at uh, the questions, many are interesting. Uh, I think that this one would be particularly useful to all of us. Uh, are there ways other than litigation to resolve dis disputes between family members? So I think the question is, um, all of us know that going to court is expensive and also troublesome, uh, draining a lot of energy. So are there any other ways other than litigation, of course, that these kind of disputes can be, can be resolved in a more efficient or cost-saving way? Yeah, I think um, so the procedure that pops up in my mind is really mediation. Um, I think a lot of us have heard about this procedure. Um, it's basically involving a third party individual who's an independent from you know, either parties to dispute. Uh, he or she would facilitate uh, settlement negotiations between the parties. Um, more often than not, during, during a face to face meeting uh, where the parties can sit together to explore ideas on how to settle the dispute. The dispute can be a family dispute, um, those that we've mentioned, or you know uh, some other you know normal civil disputes as well. And I think a lot of mediators are well equipped to handle a, a wide range of disputes, you know, arising from different practice areas. Um, so as Nathan said, I think um, as legal advisors, we have it's quite often for us to to know or to understand better, you know, the the bitter consequences of going through a long litigation. Um, so more often than not. Um, if, if a litigation drags on, then the cost um, of the litigation can be disproportionate to the outcome. And more often than not, it's a lose-lose situation for both parties. And that's why we um, do recommend, you know, throughout the process of, you know, we advising a client, uh, we still, it's still be in mind that, that there's always a possibility for parties to negotiate. Um, mediation is one of the ways. And for mediation, it can even happen you know, before the action is commenced. So sometimes, ideally, before you go to court, you can say, you, if you behave sensibly, and you can say, oh, let's, uh, we know we've got a dispute here, um, but I'm open to be solving it uh, uh, with you. Let's go to a mediator uh, and, and try to see if there's ways to avoid uh, going to court. Um, if Mediation happens. Mediation can also happens, you know, midway through a litigation. That's actually more common. But the uh, complicating factor would be that as long as soon as there's litigation, then there would be cost considerations. For example, both parties might have already uh, incurred quite a lot of legal costs, and that would complicate, you know, like who who should bear those legal costs, and that would actually complicate, you know, the settlement negotiations, uh, and so. Uh, um, diminish the chances that parties can reach a settlement. Um, so yeah, I would say um, sometimes we as legal advisors, our objective might not be to ask our clients to go for everything, to, to contest everything and to litigate. And it always comes down to a, a cost-benefit analysis, um, like how, how do you assess the likelihood of your chances of success of going to court, and how do you save your legal costs, how do you save money to achieve an outcome that's best for yourself. Yeah, may I supplement uh, Jackie's answer? Uh, Jackie has mentioned the concept of mediation. And sometimes terms, legal terms can be confusing. One similar concept is arbitration. So um, the differences between uh, arbitration and mediation would be uh, the power uh, of the third party. So in arbitration, this person, the arbitrator, actually has the power to judge make a legally binding decision, okay, binding upon both parties. And, the bo and both parties would need to obey whatever decisions that this arbitrator has made. So this is arbitration. So the idea that Jackie has mentioned 
is mediation. Mediation is different. For the mediator, he has no specific power. His role is more facilitative. So he would be like, the mediator would be like, okay, um, the mediator would talk to each party individually, separately, to understand uh, what they want, what they need, and then may, in a joint session, bring them together, give them uh, a, an opportunity to ventilate their thoughts and their demands, and just bring the parties together. So there's no power uh, on the part of the mediator to make any order or decision. There's no such thing. The product, the, I, the ideal product out of a mediation session would be a settlement agreement. So it is totally out of the um, of the will of the parties, rather than you know making of a decision by a third party. So this is the idea. Um, will it? Uh, give me the next question. Okay, thanks, Nathan. I think we have time for one quick question. Right. So this is one that we get all the time, unsurprisingly. And the question is. Um, do I have to share assets acquired before the marriage if I get a divorce? So the answer, like many things, is, well, it depends. One factor is the length of the marriage. If it was a very short marriage, then one of the parties has a greater scope to argue that any assets brought to them, brought into the marriage by them should not be shared with the other spouse um, because it may not be fair in that case where the other spouse didn't contribute to the acquisition of this asset and the marriage was fairly short-lived, so therefore it wouldn't be fair for this asset to be divided. Um, on the other hand, if the asset acquired before the marriage was used by the family, so let's say uh, one of the parties owned a home and then it was used as the family home after marriage for a number of years, then in that case it would be unfair not to share it with the other party. Um, a lot of it hinges on the length of the marriage, the nature of the asset, and whether the asset was actually shared together with the other spouse or used for the benefit of the family, or was it kept completely separate? So this is another one of those fine points that parties may seek to argue um, in divorce proceedings, and it very much depends on what, what the circumstances are at the time. So uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. So I'm going to hand it back to Dan. I think he may have some closing thoughts for the webinar. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Willard. Um, on behalf of Mondak, I would like to say thank you to our fantastic panel once again, to Shirley, Willard, Nathan and Jackie for your insights. It was an incredibly interesting webinar um, and discussion and an incredibly important one, I think, as well. Um, we'd also like to thank everybody um, from Howard Ames for their hard work putting this together behind the scenes. Um, lastly, thank you to our audience for being with us today. Uh, you'll be receiving a copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar, so please do share that widely. And we encourage you to get in touch with Howard Ames for any uh, further information that you may require. Um, once again, thank you to everyone involved today. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.